Sitman report. So let me just say this was three years after the Fukushima accident. And they answered the question about what are the main mitigation options in the energy supply sector in this way. No single mitigation option in the energy supply sector will be sufficient. Achieving deep cuts in greenhouse gas, GHG emissions, will require more intensive use of low GHG technologies such as renewable energy, nuclear energy, and carbon dioxide capture and storage. So it's hard to look into what will happen tomorrow, but if we are still trying to look into the crystal ball, what will happen? If we are to follow the recommendation of IPCC, then there will be an expansion of nuclear, which will probably lead to easily extractable uranium resources becoming depleted, which will lead to higher prices on uranium as a resource and also large quantities of radioactive waste. So we need strategies that economize on uranium resources and help solve the waste problem via reduced waste inventories. Thorium, as a part of the fuel cycle, may be one solution to this answer. If you pay attention to Norwegian media during the year 2005-2008, there was a lot to talk about thorium, thorium reactors, thorium power, thorium this and thorium that, almost as it was something God given. Well, reactors using thorium-based fuels, they may produce substantially less amounts of long-lived radioactive waste. There is more of thorium than uranium in the Earth's crust. Virtually no plutonium is produced from thorium-based fuels. And, well, I think this is a good thing for public opinion. And there is the possibility of breeding or near-breeding in a thermal neutral sector. And it's harder to produce nuclear weapons from thorium than from uranium or plutonium because the fissile uranium-233 nucleus will be poisoned by uranium-232, which results in high energy gamma rays. So let's talk about what is, what's the deal with thorium from a nuclear physicist's point of view. Thorium is a fertile material that can easily be transformed into fissile material uranium-233 if it captures a, a thermal neutron. So uh, if you compare then the process of thorium-232 capturing a neutron, decaying and decaying and becoming uranium-233, as compared to the analogous process that happens in the uranium fuel cycle, where uranium-238 captures a neutron, becomes a two, plutonium-239, uranium-233 is a better fissile material than plutonium-239. Because we need both neutrons to transform the fertile thorium into the fissile material and also to drive the chain reaction of producing the energy, the neutron economy is of great importance. We need neutrons. So if we compare uh, the so-called ETA, which is neutrons emitted per neutron observed for uranium-233, uh, sorry, neutrons emitted per neutron absorbed um, uh, for uranium-233 compared to plutonium-239, we see that it's a little bit, it's a red one, it's a little bit higher up than the plutonium. So this means that we can produce more new fissile material if we're using thorium as a fertile instead of uranium-238 as a fertile. If you look at alpha, which is the capture to fission ratio, we see that uranium-233 has a lower alpha, is about one-fifth of what the plutonium-239 uh, has. This means that we will, it's harder to produce waste from fissile uranium-233 than from plutonium-239. Also, if you look at the chart of nuclides, we see uh, on the lower, in the black square on the lower part, is the thorium, and up there in the other black square is uranium-238. There are more nutrient captures needed to produce a transuranic element from thorium. You need one, two, three, four, five before you're at uh, the transuranium uh, up there. And the only one with uranium-238. The first paper on my thesis it's called Minimization of Actinide Waste by Multi Recycling Authoritative Fuels in the EPR Reactor, which was published in Annals of Nuclear Energy. The 
Um, the thought behind this paper was to examine fluorinated fuels as an alternative to the present mock recycled fuels. And the goal was to provide greater uranium resources and lower waste inventories. MOX is for mixed oxides, and this is if you, if you recycle plutonium from the uranium fuel cycle. So it's comparing sort of recycling of the uranium fuel cycle to recycling in the fluorine fuel cycle. The EPR reactor is this one, it's called European Pressurized Water Reactor. And our thought or motivation, who would this be interesting for? We were thinking about a country with an already existing pressurized water reactor fleet. This is the, uh, the last generation of, um, of pressurized water reactors. And this could be a rapid first step towards a self sustaining thorium fuel cycle. So instead of looking at the much more innovative designs like molten salt reactors or a storage driven system where much more research and development is needed before you could actually um, employ this. Or, of course, a country with a local resource of thorium. <laughs> That's normal if one wanted to do that. What we did was that we performed um, simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, using the MURE code, MTP Utilities for Reactor Evolution, and we simulated one average assembly looking like like this. The entire nuclear reactor core consists of 241 such assemblies and it's a 17 times 17 grid of fuel pins with um, a, a control rods going in and out. And we looked at different kinds of fuels but the most, uh, the ones that I will uh, focus on are what we call S90. The S90 fuel that I also I showed here on the right side, we have taken thorium, and as I already told you, that thorium needs neutrons to be transformed into fissile material that can actually fission and release energy. So we need a neutron source. The neutron source for this fuel was highly enriched weapons uranium. So this is actually, and also a way to get rid of already existing weapons material that are in the world. And this has actually been done not with thorium, but one has used existing weapons material, burning it in, um, in uh, stable nuclear power plants. So, of course, it's different with thorium. But so, S90 consists of thorium and 90% enriched uranium. It has to be stressed then that when I say that we have 90% enriched uranium, it does not mean that 90% of the fuel is uranium. 235. It means that this small part down there on the S90, I mean the, the red thing, that is the uranium part, and that part is 90% enriched. So in total, this fuel consists of roughly 5% uh, uranium in total, and in this uranium, 90% of that would be the two to five. And we compare that to normal uh, uranium oxide fuels. So we look at the scheme where we multi-recycle the uranium. And when you recycle, you recycle the entire uranium vector. You do not only recycle the fissile component, but all of the uranium is recycled as, as one part. So every time when we put the fuel into the reactor, we had a burn up of 65 gigawatt days per ton. And we considered the transuranic elements and the fission products as waste. In this flow chart, we see that, well, um, at first we need to put in uh, UNOX, nocturnal uranium. We have to enrich it up to 90%. Then we go to the fuel fabrication. The fuel fabrication, we put in the thorium, that's where you, where you made the fuel. We put it in the EPR reactor. We have it for 65 gigawatt days per ton. Then we store it and we cool it for five years of time. And then we take it to work processing plant where uranium and thorium are reprocessed and we waste our efficient product and the plutonium and the lithium and so on. And then when we do this again we will have to add some new thorium and some new uh, enriched uranium. So the new thorium based fuels were made for, from recovered uranium and some fresh enriched uranium. And what we see when we've done this over several cycles, uh, seven in total, 
we see that the story of the fuel thingy initially more like smooth, which is called the short for separative working work, which is how we measure the enrichment work. So we need more enrichment work to begin with, and we need more natural uranium as a resource to begin with. But this investment is repaid when the fuel is reprocessed. Because what we see when we recycle the uranium is that um, here we see a plot where we have sh where it shows three different fuel cycles. So at the beginning there at um, at the x-axis equal zero, the only uranium that is there is uranium 235 in red, and then some black is uranium 238. So this is only the uranium vector here. As we go along during the burn-up, we will we will fish uranium 235, the red goes down, but we're building up bits of uranium 233 there in uh, yellow, orange, and also some other isotopes of uranium. Then for the second fuel cycle, when we have recycled the uranium, we put it in again, we see that we have to add less uranium 235 because we have quite a lot of uranium 233 in the fuel. And as we go along all the way to seven cycle cycles, this stabilizes. So over a 60 year lifetime of such a reactor, we will need uh, almost only half the amount of natural uranium as we do if it's only fueled with one fuel uranium oxide fuel cycle. And also, when we recycle the uranium, we are reducing the waste inventories. So if you look in red, it's the S90 fuel that I talked about. We also looked at thorium and 20% from its uranium, which is worse results, but, uh, but then we're not using weapons materials. So there are not just um, nuclear physical aspects to this, but also political aspects to this that, are, of course, I don't, I'm not thinking about in a way. But if we compare the S90 fuel to the UOX fuel in blue, we see that after a thousand years, we have reduced the waste with a factor of 20. That is 95% reduction of the waste. And very often when people talk, talk about thorium fuels, they say that, well, we get so much less waste. Well, this is only true if we actually recycle the uranium. But there's also here, recycling is important. We must recycle. Okay, so I said that I've done simulation, simulations. And we get better and better computers, more powerful computers, better codes and such. But no computer simulation is ever better than the experimental data, in this case, nuclear data, on which it relies. Into um, um, reactor simulation. The most important nuclear input data are cross sections that will predict what will happen, and we need these for many minutes later under a huge energy range. I can say it's impossible to measure all of these um, directly. We need neutron and gamma ray multiplicities that will determine if we can breathe or not, and also how heat is transported in the reactor. We need fish yields to know if all new free neutrons are eaten or not. They're, they're not, so we need to know this to, uh, to simulate it. For important cross-sections in the thorium fuel cycles, there are some huge differences. In this, I just show an example, and it's uh, with the core field at the Philippine Ocean, who did the power calculations in this one. Uh, what we see here are different uh, different databases, we see the EMDS, Gendal, JET, etc. They do not, um, well, they do not agree. Also, when we see the, the data points there, they're, they do not agree. And then we have the Pallet calculation agrees. There are huge differences. So, on the wish list are direct uh, nutrient induced measurements of all these cross sections because we need these for 500 nuclei within enormous energy range, it's, it's not possible. So then we need to model these cross-sections instead. But also into modeling these cross-sections goes nuclear experimental data, but then data that we can measure instead. So this is where our lab comes into, um, into play. So in the basement of the physics uh, department, we have the, uh, the Oslo Cycle Laboratory. And for 37 years, the NC35, the electronic cyclotron, has been the heart or the working force for the OCL. And 
and the accelerate uh, light um, uh, light particles like protons, neutrons, helium three, and helium four. And we see these slightly confused there, and we have the accelerate particles, and we take them out into the experimental hall and capture what you see there. And I put myself for scale if you want to know how large these things are. And inside cactus is where we find the rest of our experimental setup. So this is the setup for the experiment that I have analyzed. So during experiments in October 2012, we, we bombarded a thin uranium-233 target with deuterons of an energy of 12.5 MeV. And then we had in the setup we have particle detectors called Siri uh, that are over there on the left side. We have heat packs detector called MIPS that detects additional fragments on the right side. And then cactus, the entire thing, consists of 28 sodium iodide detectors that uh, detect gamma uh, radiation. So this setup allows us to study different coincidence reactions. Uh, we first we studied the well, it's the DP reaction we studied, but we can also then have a coincidence reaction with also efficient probability BPF, and we have done so. So this setup allows us to study both the level density and the gamma ray strength functions and transmission gamma rays. And um, what we always do in our experiment, we we need to measure the gamma rays that comes out from some nuclear reaction because the gamma rays. Is the way that the nucleus can speak, speak to us. Or to take a little mean way, we throw rocks at the nucleus and then we record it crying. And the harder we throw, the harder the nucleus cries, and then we get a picture of this. And this is how we can, or someone likes to say for tickles, I say we throw rocks at it. <laughs> and uh, then we can know how excited the nucleus is and what goes on. So I have just made a picture of this at, at the function excitation energy. In the middle there at 4.8 and we have a fission barrier of uranium-234 stars. If we are below the fission barrier, we extract the nuclear level density and the gamma ray strength function. And above the fission barrier, we can study the transmission gamma ray from fission of this nucleus. So this brings me to the second paper of the thesis, which will be submitted to PRC where we have is for level density and for the continuum gamma decay strength of the uranium 234, where we have examined nuclear level density and gamma ray strength of the uranium 234 with a focus on the sister's resonance. And we have also studied some systematics of this in the actinides uh, because these impact the N gamma cross section. So just very, very quick, the nuclear level density and the gamma ray strength functions are important inputs for modeling of cross-sections when we can't measure these directly and we need to model them instead. As I said, we still need neuter input and the NLD and the gamma SF are such inputs. So that's why they're, well for me in this case, inputs. So I have drawn a, a very excited uranium-235-234 nucleus up there, so it's up there in excitation energy. And the nuclear level density is simply a measure for the density of state as a function of excitation energy. The gamma ray strength function is a measure of the energy of the gamma rays that the nucleus prefers to emit because it will emit gamma rays, it can be many small or fewer large ones or a mixture to decay down to the ground state where it's not excited anymore. So then I use the Oslo method, which is a technique to extract both the nuclear level density and the gamma ray strength function simultaneously. So the very short recipe for this method is that first we measure the gamma rays as a function of excitation energy. That's where it comes into the throwing rocks and recording the, uh, the gamma rays. And then we have to, when we measure this, we have to unfold our gamma ray uh, matrix so that is correcting for the response of the detector. And then we get these ma the matrix that we see here on the right side. We have, we have uh, gamma ray energy on the x-axis and excitation energy of the nucleus on the y-axis. And this is the starting point for this method. From this matrix, we then extract the first generation 
gamma rays, or we also call the primary gamma rays from, uh, from the excited nucleus. And we do this by subtracting a weighted sum, and we do this iteratively, so this weighted sum finally converges to what is actually the primary gamma ray distribution. And then we get, then we have still the, what was the starting point on the left side there. On the right side we have what is called the primary uh, gamma ray or particle gamma ray matrix. And inside the, the dashed uh, area is the, um, is the area that we've done the analysis. So we stop at the fission barrier of the range 234 star because we can't distinguish between gammas originating from fission or gammas originating from uh, the nucleus decaying down back to ground state. That is not a problem for us now. Um, so this, um, this gamma ray matrix, it shows uh, a probability to decay that is proportional to the number of levels to decay to and the gamma ray transmission coefficient. And if we assume dipole radiation as we do, then the gamma ray transmission coefficient relates to the gamma ray strain function like this. The last part of our recipe is that there are many solutions possible for rho and t that will result in such um, a probability matrix. So we need, from our method, we only extract the functional form of these two, of these uh, the nuclear level of the gamma gamma strength function. But we rely on other experimental data for an absolute normalization. So we will normalize both the nuclear level density and the gamma strength function. And we start with the nuclear level density that we see there on the left side. And we get the absolute normalization by attaching our data to uh, other uh, data known from uh, spectroscopy. And we find the slope by fitting a linear constant temperature function through the point that we see in the circle and also to the neutral level density that we uh, calculate from neutron resonance data up there at the neutron separation energy. And then the slope of the gamma ray strength function is decided simultaneously with the slope of the neutral level density, but we find the absolute normalization from a total release to width. Here. And also we compare our data in, inside the pink circle there to uh, giant electric dipole resonance data from uranium-233, 234 and 235. And from this we can uh, extract uh, the M1 sisters resonance. So if you see in the insert there, uh, I have plotted the uh, our data on the tail of the giant electric dipole resonance, and we can see that there is something more. And when we subtract this tail, we end up with uh, this extracted sister's resonance. And here I've used um, from systematics of the other actinides that have been measured here in Oslo when I've seen that the sister resonance is split. And it is not as, I would say, this is an ongoing discussion between the uh, the co-authors, since this is not yet submitted, if, if it is split or not, and at least I think that um, the splitting this should be <coughs> consisting of two more similar resonances. So what we see here is in a way purely mathematics to get the least chi-square, but probably one should at least require that they are more of the same size, but that is an um, ongoing discussion. So I said that we have measured several actinide nuclei at the Oslo cyclotron and actually we've studied 12 so far and we looked at the total strength of this resonance and we see all of these as, um, as a function of mass number. So some, some places there are two, two points but it's because we have for example measured um, if we look at mass 232 for example we have measured both thorium-232 and protactinium-232, so they have the same mass, but they are different uh, different nuclei. So, uh, and 234, my uh, measurements are indicated with the dashed purple uh, pink line. So the total strength seems to be quite constant with a function of mass. 
Uh, the average energy also, and also the distance between resonances. They are more scattered, but still, I would say they, they seem to exhibit a constant, there's a constant trend. And this is interesting because when you have this extra strength at that um, gamma ray energy, that is important when we are to calculate these neutron capture cross sections or the next generation of nuclear reactors. Because if you have such an extra strength, it means that the probability of radiative capture, the probability for the nucleus to capture the neutron and emit the gamma ray instead of actually fission, increases. And we need to know this. And this again is important because five out of six of these so-called generation four reactor concepts, they utilize a fast neutron spectrum. And this is exactly in the area where we see this extra resonance. So the presence of a physics resonance affects these cross sections. And since it, it seems to be there in all the nuclei, it should be included when one calculates the n gamma cross sections. Then to what happens above the fission barrier, we can study gamma rays from fission. This is the last paper called Energy Dependence of the Prompt Gamma Ray Emission from the Deeply Induced Fission of Uranium-234 Star and Plutonium-240 Star. This paper was submitted to PRC just before Christmas, and uh, it also finally got uh, received with this as well. The, what we did here was to extract the spectral characteristics from this competition gamma rays with a DPF as a surrogate for the NF reaction. And we did this as a function of excitation energy of the fissioning system, so the excited nucleus that, that fission compound. So just very, very quickly, fission is the process upon which all nuclear uh, technology depends. All reactors that we have, they will fission heavy nuclei and then produce energy from this. So in the drawing, it's, uh, it's neutron-induced fission. So we have a fissile nucleus here using the 34 sorry, 233, being hit by neutron. Then we make a compound nucleus, uranium-234 star, which is the nucleus that we have studied in, uh, in our lab. Then at t equals zero, the nucleus fissions, and you have the fission fragments, FF, that are moving away from each other. Then uh, there will be emission of prompt neutrons and prompt fission gamma rays. So the gamma rays that you see, little, uh, little yellow arrows there, are emitted 10 to the minus 14 seconds after the moment of fission. The prompt fission gamma ray measurements uh, for, as a function of excitation energy are on the OECD NEA high priority request list. Not for this nucleus, but for the plutonium they are in the paper. I am not analyzing plutonium, but we have put them also in the paper. Then seconds here after this, we will have the late neutrons and gammas. So from the same experiment that we got nuclear devil density and the gamma ray strength function, we also extracted eight prompt fission gamma ray spectra, and these are for different excitation energy bins of the fissioning uranium 234 star nucleus. And this is, to my knowledge, the first time that prompt fission gamma ray spectra have been extracted as functions of excitation energy. And as you can see, they are more or less very much the same. They have the same, they exhibit the same shape and are very much on top of each other. From this, we have looked at the spectral characteristics. We have looked at the total gamma ray energy, the average gamma ray energy, and the multiplicity. How many uh, gamma rays are emitted as a function of excitation energy here on the x-axis. What we see is that Trends for these, all these spectral characteristics are roughly constant. What you also see, because we have compared to, uh, you see uh, my data in red, uh, also is a blue star, it's not so easy to see, but it's just before seven up there. We have a direct neutron induced measurement of thermal neutrons, you see that we, I am higher up in this one. And we have also compared to calculations made with the jet code for different spins. And these charged particle induced reactions, they introduce more spin than the neutron induced one, which is also what we see in different experiments where one uses 
through this particular tool. Um, and the comments that we uh, have got on, on the referee report is that they would like to see also since 15, and um, that is basically, uh, that's the, the very positive referee report. So, <clears throat> just very quickly, a uh, future outlook. Um, I would say that we should definitely aim to have a realistic January spending function as an input when one does cross-section calculations. And these are important when direct measurements, for example, from very radioactive nuclei, can't be made. And not including the sitters resonance leads to a less predictive power of models of unmeasured cross-sections. When it comes to the simulations of VPR reactor, there are ways to improve the results by looking at, for example, heterogeneous configuration of the fuels, and these should be explored in detail. Very, very excitingly for our lab is that we are in the process of um, we are in the process of getting twenty six or eight now I can't remember the number correctly, but large lanthanum bromide detectors that will improve in a better twenty six I can see it in my notes now better gamma ray energy resolution a lower gamma ray energy threshold and also very good timing resolution that will make us able to discriminate between neutrons and gammas, which we cannot do today. So, and there will be studying more actinides in the alpha cycle from the border, and also redoing these measurements will be very, very exciting. Also, I, I, before I end this thing, I will also say that when I think about future outlook, I, I, must, I must say that when I wrote my thesis, I have written it in a very probably a more popular way than is common for a PhD thesis. And this was intentional, because I think that the role that the scientist plays in society is important, and I think that the results that we get, should we should be able to also communicate them out to not just a very small group of co-scientists. So I think that is also part of the future outlook. I, um, I wish to see even more communication of science out there. If I shall just um, recap my thesis in three graphs, I would say that thorium-based fuels can be used in the EPR reactor and they may produce substantially less amount of radioactive waste. The scissor resonance should be included in cross-section calculations and the transmission gamma rays seem to be rather independent of excitation energy 